Uh, It is so good to be with you this morning. We are finishing off our series that was titled Scripture Practicing the Ways of Jesus. And the intention, the drive behind this entire series, if you were to go back, we've actually, this is like week number eight. It hasn't all been in order. We started it way back, I think in November, took a break for, for Advent, for Christmas, came back to it in February, took another break, Lent, Easter, and then we came back to it in June. And so this has been a long journey. And if you're just visiting today, or if you're just tuning into our podcast for the first time, or watching on YouTube, or however it is that you are hearing my voice right now, um, I would really encourage you to make sure you go back and and check out those other weeks. Uh, Because this is something that we've built on. It's something that's kind of flowed one idea out of the next, out of the next. And so if you're just hearing this, the final one, uh, you... I think there's some things in here that make the most sense when they're understood in the context of the weeks that have come before it. So this is our final time looking at this. I mean, we'll continue to talk about Scripture and and engage Scripture and how do we read it uh, throughout our entire life as a church. Uh, But we're going to be stopping after this week, and next week, as we dive into our summer series, we're going to be looking at the book of 1 John. So if you even want, you want some homework, you can go through and read through 1 John this week. It's not very long. I think it's five chapters, and you can go and you can read through that, and we'll be working on that together as a community throughout the summer months. Uh, But before I dive into our text and to our topic this morning, I want to just start with some resources. I actually highlighted these way back in November, but these are resources that have been incredibly helpful for me and my journey as I engage Scripture, as I make it a part of my life, as I read it, Uh, and my invitation for you would be to also to utilize these. Um, The first is two books. They're written by the same authors, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Uh, And they simply have, there's two books called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth and How to Read the Bible Book by Book. And these are phenomenal books. They've uh, been significant for me, not just in prepping for the series, but just in my own faith formation as I engage scripture. And so if you are a reader, um, and even if you're not, I think these are really helpful resources to have uh, for you as you read and engage scripture. And they, uh, the first one, how to read the Bible for all it's worth, the first two chapters get pretty technical. And beyond that, it starts to talk about genre. Uh, earlier on in the series, we talked about how the Bible is a library. And so the invitation for you to engage with this is to learn more about the genres that you find, that you encounter as you read through scripture. And it helps give you a lens as you read to be able to engage it in a way. It, under- it helps explain context and-, and helps you understand the historical setting in which some of these books take place. It's a really really helpful resource. And so I simply say that. The other one is how to read the Bible book by book. Keep going, go back. Um, And this one is just, it breaks down every single book in the Bible. And I actually like to use this in my own personal time of reading scripture, my own personal time of study. Occasionally I'll come to a new book, a lot of the time with Old Testament books, and I just forget what is actually going on in this text, what's happening. This is a great thing to just go through, read through the chapter. I'm reading through the book of Malachi. What happens in Malachi? When was this written? Who's this written to? It's an incredible resource to be able to just go to read through it, to get a great overview of the book, some of the major themes that are there, other relevant information that's helpful to understand that passage or that book of the Bible better. And so I highly recommend these two resources. The second one, for those who are not readers, is something called the Bible Project. Uh, This is uh, an organization, I think it's out of Portland, Oregon, uh, and they essentially, they just create resources for you to engage with. You can check them out on YouTube. They have a website. Predominantly, they make these amazing high-quality videos that look at different themes words or themes that you see, you encounter throughout scripture. They also do just phenomenal breakdowns of books of the Bible, and they identify the key themes and ideas and give you context. And so what you might consider doing as you are are reading through the Bible on your own is before you get to a new book, go and check out the Bible Project, see if they have a resource there, watch the video. They also have a podcast, which is an incredible resource as well. Uh, And so I think that's just really worthwhile for you to engage with, and it's free. You can just go check it out. It's a Google search or whatever it is you use now. The last one is an app, and I think is a great app. It is called Lectio 365. And this is, a for us, as we engage Scripture, we don't want to simply just be about ideas We want this to be about changing us, for for Christ to be formed in us as we read, as we uh, prayerfully engage Scripture. And this is a phenomenal resource. It is an app that you can download to your phone if you have one. And daily, it kind of provides two different resources, one that's great for the mornings, one that's great for the evenings. And it gives you Scripture, and it gives you questions and prayers, and just leads you through a process of reflection on the Scripture text. And so I think this is a phenomenal resource. It is a great tool, and uh, I highly recommend it. It is worth checking out. It's worth the download. It's worth engaging in. 
Well, to come back to our original intent from the very beginning, I think I stated this in our first uh, episode of this series, it was this, is that the goal for us as we engage scripture is not information. Our goal is not information, it is formation. And so our hope is that as we are reading through scripture, it's not just filling our head with more and more knowledge, with impressive Bible Bible trivia, or, or even memorizing scripture, although that is a really good thing to do. But rather for us, our goal is formation, to be formed more, to become more and more like Jesus, to have hearts that love and long for the things that God loves and longs for, and to care about people and to care about the things that God cares about. And so that's our goal. And I hope that that just comes across in this entire series as we look at a giant overview that is at the very core of it all. I hope that as you walk away from this series, it's not just more and more knowledge about all these different things and that you can answer questions, but rather that you would be feel as you engage Scripture that you would open yourself up to it and be engaged by the questions that Scripture asks of us. As we've been walking through this kind of final chapter of our series, there is a, essentially a statement that we, I think is very helpful for us to engage with so that we can know how to read and react to Scripture. And so I want to put that up on the screen right now. It's this. The Bible is a library that is both divine and human that tells one united story that points to Jesus and empowers us for mission. And so I want to focus on that last point this morning, how the Bible empowers us for mission. Another way that I would put it, I just want to present to you this morning, is this, that the Bible is a catalyst. Now, for some of you, maybe you're trying to think all the way back to when you took chemistry in high school, and you're like, catalyst, what does that officially mean? I'm not talking about this in the official sense of the word. I'm using this in a much more generic sense, in that the catalyst is something that that starts a reaction, that creates or speeds up change within us. And as we engage the Bible, I believe that the Bible has the power through God speaking, through God's Holy Spirit working in our hearts to change us and to transform us and to make us more like Jesus. And so the question I want to pose to you this morning and the question that I want us to wrestle with this morning is this. What is God's mission and how can the Bible be a catalyst for it? Let me read that question again. What is God's mission and how can the Bible be a catalyst for for it. Now, to understand when we talk about God's mission, because a lot of the time churches or businesses or organizations will throw around the phrase mission, and it can mean a whole bunch of different things. But for us as Christians, as we take seriously this term mission, it is not some idea or concept that we just make up. Rather, we live with the deep conviction that we are not the ones who create mission. We're not the ones who come up with the idea of mission. Rather, God is on a mission. And the mission that we have as churches is always joining in and partnering with God's mission. When we talk about the word missionary, sometimes people being overseas, uh, speaking to people who have not heard about Jesus or engaging cultures that, that live in ways that are very contrary to the way of Jesus, when we talk about them being on mission, we are not saying they're going there and coming up with some brand new idea. Rather, we are under the understanding that God has a heart for people, that he is rescuing people, saving them, bringing into his divine life, and that the call for us as Christians is to join in on what God is doing. And our best way of understanding what God is doing and the calling that is being placed on us as we engage in mission is to look at what is the bigger mission that God is up to, that God has been up to since the very beginning and God continues to be up to today. And so I wanna go back to a, uh, essentially the the plot chart that I shared with you last week, if you listened to, or if you were here last week or if you were listening to the sermon, I think this is a helpful tool. It just kind of gives us kind of a broad overview of the bigger story that we see in scripture, the bigger mission that God was up to at the very beginning. And so the story begins in oneness, We could call it creation and calling. God creates humanity, invites humanity into this intimate, connected relationship with himself. And God invites humanity to be in this committed, connected, intimate relationship with one another. There's oneness. There isn't division. 
There isn't tension. And while there is difference, there is still unity in the midst of that. We call it oneness. But then we talk about sin and how sin creeps into the hearts of people and they defiantly choose to go their own way, not just simply the first humans, but rather all throughout history. We see again and again humans choosing to go their own way, placing themselves in the position of God, saying, God, we think we know what is best. And as we do that more and more, we just see a more and more falling away from the oneness that God created for us to experience with himself and with each other and with all the rest of creation. And we see otherness just kind of snowballing and becoming more and more profound until finally God creates a covenant community a community that is going to be moving people, pointing people towards the oneness that God created them for. He calls Abraham and creates a covenant with him and gives him a a calling and an invitation in the world to be a blessing and that through him all other nations will be blessed. We see this continued on through Moses and the calling to the people of Israel to be a people who will bless the entire world. In fact, the, the language that's used there to be a nation of priests. They were to be this example of godliness to the world, who God really truly is, what God is like. And essentially they they function in this intermediate position or mediation position where they represent God to the rest of the world. And yet throughout Israel's story, we see them again and again falling away. They continuously get caught up in their own way of doing things. And rather than being faithful to the way of God, they are faithful to their own wants and desires. And we see more and more otherness entering into the world. Until finally, God, incarnate in human flesh, comes in Jesus. And where Israel, where humanity failed, and where Israel failed, we see Christ is faithful, that lives the perfect, sinless life, is a perfect image of who God is, and lives in perfect unity with his Father. And we see the otherness the brokenness in our world become redeemed. We see salvation enter in. And then we enter into this stage of commission where the people of God who in faith surrender themselves to Jesus Christ and become a part of this mission in the world until finally it moves towards consummation, which we read about at the end of the book of Revelation of heaven coming down and God dwelling amongst his people in just a real, tangible and real way that even supersedes the experience that we have in knowing and walking with Christ here and now. It is an experience of perfect oneness and unity. It is one that both calls back to the very beginning and yet invites us into something else new. And as we engage with the mission of God, we begin to see this mission here laid out for us, one of oneness, redemption, back to oneness. And now I want to take a look at the book of Acts. So if you've got a Bible, I want to invite you to open it up to Acts chapter 2. And uh, here in this story, we have just encountered Jesus has been risen from the dead. He's ascended to his father and he's given his Holy Spirit to his disciples. And they've had this radical encounter with the Spirit. Just amazing things are happening. And there's an audience of people, of Jewish people who are just kind of, what is going on? On here. And so the, uh, Peter, Jesus' disciple, he speaks up and he essentially gives what I think would be one of the first sermons not given by Jesus. And he goes and he proclaims what they are seeing and encountering. Essentially, and his entire time, he's just pointing to Jesus the entire time. He's just saying the work that is happening, the amazing things that you're seeing and encountering are being done to testify to what God has done through Jesus. And so Peter, he concludes his sermon. It's worth your time to just go through and read through the entire thing at some point, but we just don't have time to do the whole thing this morning. I want to go right to the climax of his story, which is the climax, or the climax of his sermon, which is the climax of the mission story that God invites us into. Here's what Peter says, starting at verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, the Jewish audience, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. 
And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received the word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And so first off, we have this statement, or or essentially this, this sermon that climaxes in Peter pointing to Jesus. He's not just simply giving advice. He's not talking about some sort of philosophy. This is not some sort of mythical explanation about something magical that happens in your heart when you hear this story. Rather, he is talking about something that God has done in history through Jesus. And he is pointing them towards this, and he's inviting them to be faithful to this truth, to this fact, to this reality. I might just break it down this way, just to put it in a column. We just say this, that the faithful way that to respond to what is being known or being proclaimed here is, first and foremost, is that Jesus is Lord and Christ. And those are controversial words to be used during that time. Lord was something that you said about Caesar. Essentially, it was viewed as being this divine ruler authority over all of the known world. And Peter equates this man who was put to death on a cross by the Roman elites and the Jewish elites and says, no, no, wait, actually, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Jesus is actually the the, the true Lord over all of creation. And Peter also uses this word Christ, which sometimes we use as being Jesus' last name, but it's actually loaded with so much more meaning. It was a Jewish term, or it's the Greek word for the Jewish word, or the Hebrew word, Messiah. He was the one who was going to save and deliver God's people, save them from their sin, save them from exile, save them from the otherness that they experienced with the God who created them for perfect union. And so here we see this message proclaimed about what God has done, that through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, God has declared that Jesus is Lord and Messiah. And then because of this fact, because of this reality, Peter proclaims this next truth. This is the response he demands of the people who are hearing his sermon. He says this, there is a call to repent and to be baptized. Repent is essentially the word turn around. It's to think different. It's say, you used to live this way, you used to walk this way, you used to commit yourself to these ideas and these principles and, and making your life about these things. And it's this invitation to say, no, I'm going to turn away from that. I'm going to do a 180 and start to live in a different way. I'm going to start to think differently. The term baptize carries with it this idea of dying and coming to new life or of going under the water and being cleansed of the old way of life. And so those two terms come together and it presents this picture of turning away from the lords of their lives, the political figures, the things that they worship, the false gods, whatever it might be, and stop looking at them to save you and instead follow the way of Jesus. Die to that old way, be be purged of that old way and step into the new thing. And then he says this, and receive the Holy Spirit. Open your life up to being changed and transformed to the work that God wants to do in you, in the leading and guiding that he wants to have in your life. And then finally, he says this, know that the promise is for everyone. There's this bigger, more beautiful picture that, that uh, Peter is saying that we, we see take place in Jesus, that God's salvation, God's forgiveness, God's new life is not just set aside for a specific one tight-knit little group of people who get everything right, but rather God desires everyone to be saved, for everyone to know and experience the new life that he created for, the oneness that he created them for. So if we were to look through, we just look at this all being kind of a faithful understanding about God's mission. These are the things we want to be faithful to as we live out and we proclaim God's mission. These are all important things. That Jesus is Lord and Christ. There's a call to repent and be baptized, to leave away behind an old way of life, enter into a new life. There's this invitation and this gift to receive God's Holy Spirit, to have God reside and live with you and to lead you and to guide you and to realize that, that this same oneness that God invites each and every one of us into, this gift of salvation, of life, of hope beyond death, and the separation that sin causes to, to be redeemed and reconciled to God is to know that this promise is extended to everybody, not just to the people we like or who look like us. Now then, notice the response 
that the people have. Okay, so these are kind of the faithful elements that we'd say. But then there is this other part. I'm just going to call it the innovation part. And so I want to continue on in this passage. So if you've got your Bible, I invite you to turn or just look. You don't have to go far. Just go to verse 42. Here's what it says. Their response. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, so we have this sermon that is given. And then we have a response. Now, you can go back and read through the whole sermon, see this for yourself. But at no point are any of the things that the church does specifically laid out that they are required to do. Rather, we see a response to these truths. Can we go to the next slide? These faithful truths, these things that we are to hold on to that, that inspire, that, that, that ignite something in us. But then there's this element of innovation. Just look at some of the things, the way that they respond, and just to kind of summarize a few of them. First off, innovation, they have a radical new way of life. We see as they respond to this good news, who Jesus is, the, the call to be baptized, the, 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 to receive God's spirit, to, to have a wider, bigger understanding about God's gift of salvation. It leads them to live a radically different way of life, and it leads them to have a different ordering of Life. They begin to gather in one another's homes. They begin to devote themselves, surrender themselves to the apostles' teaching. They, they begin to pursue things differently. They, they, they uh, surrender themselves to, to prayers and to engaging in life together. Uh, they even do this. They practice new behaviors. And we go to the next slide. Practice the, uh, new practices and behaviors. I mean, they engage in giving away everything. They have this radical generosity that they begin to live in and to live out of. As they take what they have, they sell it off, and they share it with the other people around them. And, and then finally, we see this radical new community begin to emerge. They're, it's new and it's deeper community. In fact, if you continue to follow the, the line throughout the rest of Scripture, you see that suddenly the, the barriers of just uh, along ethical or sorry uh, ethnic lines, where it's just simply the Jewish people who kind of have this belief that they are the, the ones, you have to become a Jewish person in order to worship Jesus. And they're actually saying, no, 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 actually it's, it, it's about everyone. That this is actually God's heart from the very beginning, that all would be brought in to the God's family through the work of Jesus. And so here we see these two things going hand in hand. There is this faithful understanding and it's paired with innovation. I think it's a helpful term to simply look at it this way. It's faithful innovation. We see these two things going hand in hand. And as we engage in scripture, I believe that scripture is to be a catalyst for faithful innovation as we live out the mission of God in our world. Now, it is so important that both of these words be here. And I want to focus on the innovation part because sometimes we can hear that and essentially we can be drawn to this answer, well, does that mean we just get to make up whatever we want? Does that mean that as Christians, we just know we can do whatever we want. We don't need to worry about doing right and wrong. In fact, we just kind of just come up with the newest ideas and maybe we just think if it's making more disciples or if it's making, getting more and more converts or if it's getting the message out more and more, then we should do it. We can compromise. We can live just like everyone else. It's totally fine. And I think that it's important for us to make sure that we hold that first term there, faithful innovation. I think a helpful example of this might be for us as we engage in this in our own journey. How do we be faithfully innovative? Is to, uh, I just kind of have this kind of hypothetical scenario that I think is helpful to help line this up for us. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with William Shakespeare. Uh, if, you, if you ever went to high school, you probably had to read a play by him. And uh, you, I mean, I'm sure that even if you haven't read a play by him, you're probably familiar with his hits, right? Like Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet. There, there's all sorts there. And some of you are already, I'm just watching you. You're like, no, please, I'm feeling triggered, uh, taking you back to high school. Uh, 
most people, at least the, uh, who speak English, would generally regard him as probably one of the greatest playwrights in the English language. And he has written all sorts of plays. Um, and, and then there's some people who are like Shakespeare truthers who say that he didn't actually write them all, it's someone else. Anyways, not going into that, that's fine. You can go and do your own research on that. I have no opinion on that. But I want to invite you into a hypothetical situation here. Imagine we discovered a play, long lost play by William Shakespeare. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's five, or the five act play. It is a creative story. It is very much in line with all of his other plays. And at the same time, he just, there's new things. And it seems that, oh, maybe he didn't finish this or whatever it might be. Or he, he, for whatever reason, he never got it performed. And however, we see it and we realize this is a masterpiece. But there is one problem. This five act play is missing the fourth Act. We have Acts 1, 2, 3, and Act 5, but we are missing Act 4. And the question would be, well, what do we do? How do we figure out what to do in this particular case? This play is too good to just leave aside. It is too good to ignore, and it's too powerful to just simply perform as it is, to leave out the fourth act. Like you need that piece. It's important and it's significant. And yet we don't have the script. We don't know what it says. And so what would we do? How would we respond? Well, I think one of the best ways to do it would be to find people who are deeply ingrained in Shakespearean tradition, who know his plays, who know his style, and who would spend a significant amount of time engaging the first three acts and the fifth act, who know the overarching story inside and out, who understand who Shakespeare is and the kind of stories that he tells, and for them to begin to creatively craft the fourth act, one that takes very seriously and remains faithful to the first three acts, and one that takes very seriously and remains faithful to the final act, but who looks at that other act, the missing act, and says, how can we make this a part of the bigger story that Shakespeare was telling? I would say that this is a perfect example of what we might mean when we talk about faithful innovation. If we go back to our story chart, Right? We see this story that's laid out. Um, I don't have five acts. I wish I could have just lined it up perfectly. That would have been a lot of fun. Uh, but we have the bigger story that God is telling all the way up to its climax in Jesus Christ. And then we have this other act, the consummation, right? We know where all of creation is going, where God's heart for creation is from the beginning and God's heart perfectly revealed to us in Jesus Christ. But we find ourselves in that commissioning acts where we have to wrestle with, hey, how do we live this out? How do we be faithful to the story? And so we're blessed with these texts, the stories in the book of Acts. We're blessed with, with all the different letters throughout the New Testament. But at the same time, we are trying to figure out how do we live this out here and now? And that calls us and invites us into faithful innovation. And that is something that only can happen as we are faithful to the story that has come before us and as we keep in mind, ever in mind, ultimately the final act, where it's all going. The invitation for all of us is to engage in scripture with this in mind. And as we try to live out faithful innovation, it flows out of being deeply rooted and grounded in the bigger story that God is telling. When our innovation begins to break away, when we begin to take liberties with the story that came before where we lose congruence or, or the story stops making any kind of sense, we begin to move into dangerous places. And in the same way, when we lose sight of what the end is about, or what God's heart for all of creation is through Jesus Christ, we miss out on what God is really doing. And we miss out on being faithful in the midst of the season of innovation that we are called to as Christians. I mean, we've seen this in stories before. I actually think that as we see all sorts of different uh, popular, uh, whether it's comic book characters or Star Wars figures or whatever it is, like all these different movies that are kind of getting rebooted and revived and the stories are being continued, uh, the ones that are successful 
are the ones that remain faithful to the story and to the through line. And the ones that often fail are the ones where they, it's just there's no congruence with what came before it, where they, they make characters completely different or they take the heroes and they think they're doing a cool twist by making those he- heroes in the previous trilogy, turning them into the villain. And you see this response of people going, you are not being faithfully innovative with this story. You are missing out on it. And for us as Christians, that is so important to who we are and what we do. We want to be faithfully innovative. Now, one of the things that Peter calls out in his sermon, he uses a term, and I want to draw us back to it. He calls the, the, essentially the surrounding people around him, he refers to them as a crooked generation. Now, the way that we might look at that is they're bent or they're going off course. And so for us, sometimes we can hear crooked and we think about like criminals or maybe you think about like crooked police officers or crooked politicians or whatever it might be, people who are in it for themselves. And often we think about them engaging in deplorable behavior. But here, Peter doesn't just simply have the people that we would easily identify as being evil and bad in mind. Here, Peter also has in mind simply anyone who does not see and understand Christ as being the climax of God's story. He's saying, you crucified the Messiah. You missed it. And because of that, you are going off in the wrong direction. You're losing sight about who God is and what God calls you to. And so for us, we can look, and the truth is, is that Christians throughout all of history have always lived and always engaged in a crooked generation. It doesn't matter who's in political leadership. It doesn't matter what figure is on the throne. It doesn't matter what's being taught in schools. We have always existed in a crooked generation because we have always existed in a place that does not ultimately keep Christ on the throne. And so for us, as we engage with the Bible... It is one that is constantly calling us to engage our crooked generation. It is constantly saying, hey, this is, this is the picture of oneness. This is the kingdom of God's reign being expressed in the world that we are invited into. In what ways is our crooked generation steering us away from that? There are three things I would just invite you to as you engage in Scripture. I think these are important things to keep at the front of your mind, to prayerfully consider The first one is, how does Scripture confront our allegiances? Going back to Peter's sermon, he he declares that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, Messiah. This is a direct confrontation towards the allegiances of his audience then and to any audience reading through that sermon today. And when we think about our allegiances, often we don't like to think about idolatry, Uh, But there are all sorts of things that grab a hold of our hearts and consume us. They're destructive ideas. They're things that we sacrifice for. It could be money. It could be sex. It could be self-expression. It could just simply be pride. It, It could be about how we're seen by other people. It can be family. It can be all sorts of things. Anything that gets in the way of us truly surrendering our life in total faithfulness to Jesus. And so as we engage in Scripture, it confronts our allegiances. What are the idols in our life? What are the things that we just surrender to and would serve with all of our hearts? The next thing as we engage Scripture is that it should challenge our assumptions. Uh, I I often hear, uh, just from people, and I even experience this in my own life, which is I look at certain aspects in our world and our culture, and I just can't think, how messed up is that? Like, this is just so disturbing and messed up, and it it makes me sad. Sometimes it makes me angry. But I actually think that the most dangerous thing is not the things that disturb us and make us angry or upset that we see in our culture, and we go, this is so far away from the way of Jesus. It's, It's actually the assumptions that I go along with our culture, all the ways in which I'm exactly the same. I'm living with the same sort of underlying, whether it's, a, it's a, an addiction to money or to the security of, that wealth brings into my life, um, whether it's certain ways of just being like, hey, this is what's important. This is what I'm going to live for. This is what I want our family to live for. This is how I want to be seen and perceived by other people. And that's what our culture believes, and I just so easily go along with it, and I don't question it. And I believe that the calling for all of us as Jesus followers, as we engage in Scripture, is to allow Scripture to challenge our assumptions. 
the assumptions that we just kind of just, we just go along with in the crooked generation in which we live and the crooked generations that have come before us. And the final one is that we would discern opportunities. As we read the Bible, as we have it open before us, that we would constantly be going, God, I want to serve you. I want to be faithful to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the one that I go to to be saved and transformed and shaped by. And out of that would flow, what are opportunities that you are bringing my way? For some of us on the individual level, this can be about conversations. This can be about opportunities to be generous. This also can be about, are there creative ways, innovative ways that I can be living out Jesus' mission? It might be about caring for the people who are pushed to the margins. It might be about reaching out to people who haven't heard about Jesus or who have misguided misunderstandings, uh, misguided ways of seeing and understanding who Jesus is. This can also be about something that we experience as a church community, as we go, God, where are you calling us to serve and be innovative in ways that are about your kingdom, that are about the things that you love and that you care about? As we engage, as we read scripture, my hope is that it would confront our allegiances, challenge our assumptions, and that through it we would discern opportunities that God is placing in front of us. As we read the Bible, it should not only be a text that we obey, but a story we play in. I've wrestled with this statement. I like, wrote it up originally on Wednesday this week, and I'm like, I don't love it, and I've been wrestling with it throughout the course of the week, and I still has not kind of come the way that I wanted it to come together. But I like that I word play, where there's this idea of God, if we are faithful to what God's mission is about, it invites us to be creative, to go, how can we reach people? How can we be beautiful expressions of what Jesus is about in the world that we live in? How can we can courageously confront the lies and the destructive behavior that we see in the world around us and proclaim a better way that we find in Jesus? I think a helpful way to frame it is this. Many of you are probably fa- familiar with this person here. Uh, if you're not, I think he's, everyone knows who this is, right? Steve Jobs, who was the CEO and co-founder of Apple Computers. And uh, in 2011, Steve Jobs had to step down from his role uh, due to uh, pancreatic cancer, which ultimately he died from. And at that time, appointed in the position is this guy, who you also might know, which his name is Tim Cook. And he took over the role of CEO for Apple Computers. Now, the question we might ask is, what does it mean to be faithful? Because Steve Jobs, if you've read through his biography or if you know anything about him, incredibly innovative, creative, came up with some amazing ideas. And he was so into all the little details. I mean, he made Apple computers what it was. At the time, many people were going, if Steve Jobs is gone, how will Apple survive? How will they continue to grow and to impact the market and all those different things? And when Tim Cook stepped in, there was all sorts of questions. How are we going to do this? Now, you'll notice, if you just think back that far, I don't know, and again, this is no uh, evangelism for Mac computers or anything like that, but what this is saying is that you'll notice when Tim Cook took on that role, he didn't just keep doing all the same things that Steve Jobs did. He didn't just go and make the exact same products over and over and over again, right? He didn't just do the same thing. Rather, what he did was carry on in the same, we might say, spirit of Steve Jobs in being creative and moving things forward. And we see all sorts of new, potentially light world-changing products continue to come through Apple. To just simply do the same thing over and over again that Steve Jobs did would completely miss the point about what it means to be faithful to Steve Jobs. It meant doing things in the same spirit as Steve Jobs. They began to explore and be innovative and be creative and to continue to challenge expectations about what is and going into a new realm of what could be. As we engage in Scripture, we are invited into that same process. Not just simply about recreating. If we go back and all we get from Acts chapter 2 is that, oh, we should probably go and do all these things, gather in people's houses, break bread together. We all got to sell everything that we own, which actually might be, might be what God calls us to here. That'd be a pretty radical way of living. But if that's all we read it as being some rules about what you are supposed to do, we're missing the point. 
Rather, what we're seeing is a community responding in faithful innovation to the truth about what God has done through Jesus. And as they do that, they are confronting their allegiances, they are challenging their assumptions about what makes for life and security, and they are discerning new opportunities that God is placing in front of them. And so as a church, as as Christians, we want to continue to work out as we engage with Scripture. God, where are you calling us to? As we read, as we prayerfully meditate on Scriptures, we have it in front of us. We want to go, God, what are you calling us to? What are you calling me to in the relationships and the opportunities and the giftings and the skills in my careers or, or in my hobbies, whatever it might be? God, what are the opportunities to be about your mission in this world? There's a quote from a theologian and writer named Friedrich Buchner, um, which I love. And he, this is from a book he's called The Bible Without Tears. And I just love this little note here. He says, if you look at a window, you see fly specks, dust, the crack where Junior's Frisbee hit it. If you look through a window, you see the world beyond it. And I think that's the invitation for us. So many of us, as we are engaging Scripture, we are looking at Scripture And when we engage the Bible as a catalyst, we begin to see through Scripture. That God's transformative salvation work through Jesus Christ becomes the lens through which we engage and see our entire world. The Bible is a catalyst. It is an opportunity for us to get stirred up and to be moved towards towards Jesus and to discover God's mission in this world. And if the Bible is not moving us more towards the people that God loves, and if the Bible is not moving us to love more the way that Jesus loves, I would argue we are completely missing the point of it. And as we engage Scripture, as we read it, as we meditate on it, as we memorize it, it's not just simply for our head knowledge, but it is to send us out into the world to give witness to, to give glimpses of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. It's not to make ourselves look good or smart or creative or really, really moral. Rather, it's to point everyone to Jesus. Because here's the painful reality. We can't change the world. But we don't need to. Our invitation is to be faithful to Jesus and know that he has already changed the world through the cross and the resurrection. And that's our hope. In the Gospel of John, Jesus concludes his time with his disciples. He says this, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We are invited into the mission of God. Not because of how good we are, not because of how smart we are or how innovative we are, but because God wants to save us. God wants to know us. God wants to be one with us. And as God sent Jesus into the world, Jesus sends us out to proclaim his good news to everybody. This morning, the invitation is to come to the table. And as I've focused how Scripture sends us out into the world, I want to focus on the first part of that. As we engage in this meal together, we proclaim that Jesus was sent by the Father so that we would know and experience salvation. And so as you come to receive, we have uh, serving places up here at the front, two at the back, go wherever is most convenient for you. And the invitation as you come is just simply know that before you do anything, before you get anything right, that God has made the first move in Jesus.